hello, and I'm Angel Peterchev, and I probably have the most exotic affiliation uh, to the Department of Psychiatry here. But I'm an electrical engineer by training, and um, part of our work is now branching out to what my PhD was in, which is uh, electrical energy conversion and, and storage. Um, the reason I'm in psychiatry is that we use the kind of technology that you'll see also for devices for magnetic brain stimulation, where we need high energies and um, high voltages and currents. So that's the link. What I'm going to talk about is electrical energy storage. Um, you may know, for example, from recent uh, press coverage about the Tesla Powerwall, which is basically a fancy name for, for a, a system of batteries that you can put in your garage. And if you have solar energy panels, they can um, store energy overnight, and, and you can kind of run sort of off-grid. So there's, uh, uh, as, as we see more uh, penetration of renewables that are transient, like solar and wind. You know, the wind doesn't blow all the time, and there isn't sunlight all the time. We need storage solutions that are practical. So uh, batteries are obviously a mainstream way of, of storing energy, and the technology has been improving over time, although not as dramatically as some other technologies. But you can do a lot in what, how you use existing battery technologies, and this is what our, uh, this part of our work is on. So here I'm showing a conventional system for any battery energy storage. You basically have a, a battery pack that consists of many individual battery units that are all hardwired in series and in parallel to get enough current and voltage out of these battery systems. However, because you have these discrete units, you need management electronics to make sure that they're all balanced and uh, kind of the current is shared and the voltage is balanced on all units. Then you connect this to some kind of converter, for example, a DC to AC converter or inverter, right? Because the battery is DC and our AC grid is AC. The, we have AC voltages on the power outlet. And that's done with magnetics, transformers, power electronics. So this involves expansive transformers, basically magnetics that doesn't scale down with like Moore's law or anything like that. It's, it's uh, big bulk and expansive. Um, it requires high voltage components because this pack has to be relatively high voltage and it's interfaced to a high voltage system. If one of these units fails, the whole thing is useless, right? So the weakest link determines performance. Even if it's kind of running okay, if one is not doing very well, the whole performance is compromised. And as a result, you can have suboptimal efficiency because you don't get maximum use of each individual unit. We have an alternative approach that gets rid of the magnetics and embeds automatic uh, battery management. And it's a very simple concept, actually. You, you unpack these individual battery units instead of having them hardwired, and you electronically, dynamically reconnect them to form the voltage, for example, AC alternating current voltage that you want. So you have a system of, of a modular system with dynamic reconfigurability that is reconfigured in real time to create, for example, 60 hertz voltage. This is what each uh, individual module looks like. You have the battery storage element and you have a bunch of um, semiconductor switches that can be now low voltage because the maximum voltage of the system is, is basically divided across all these modules. So you don't need transformers. The actual transformation occurs by reconfiguring the DC voltage sources. You can use each of these modules low voltage and relatively cheap and you have this uh, economy of scales because you have many modules that are exactly the same. You can use their reconfiguration to optimize efficiency. Um, these batteries periodically go all in parallel, so they're automatically balanced. Um, and this system um, has fault tolerance, that is one module can fail, and you can still keep running with the rest, and you can easily scale the system by adding more modules. So this is a quick illustration of what happens with how you can reconfigure batteries to get different voltage levels. This is, you know, one, the kind of first voltage level, just the voltage of one module, then um, two, three, four, five, and this is the maximum, all batteries in series. This is our experimental prototype. We have several, and this is developed with uh, energy initiative funding. Eight module system, experimental results. This is a nice sine wave voltage, almost 100 volts. You get this from actually car batteries, from 12 volt batteries, without magnetics, very smooth, sinusoidal waveform, without any magnetic filtering. Um, 
and also excellent balancing. This is over five hours of operation. So that's all we have, and thanks to my collaborators. Good afternoon, my name is William Poon, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the MEMS department in the group of Volker Bloom. On April 23rd, the Solar Impulse 2 made a historic two and a half day flight from Hawaii to the San Francisco Bay. While many technologies went into this, for example, battery technology, one of the key technologies was the monocrystalline solar cells on board generating power. As theorists, photovoltaic technology is particularly attractive because many of the key um, design features in photovoltaics can be understood on an atomistic level. And we actually have an exact theory for that. It's quantum mechanics as devised by Schroeder and Dirac. So this is just our group here. Many of the materials that we work at on our, in our group are energy materials. I would like to highlight two people here, the grad students who helped on this work. In particular, Tong Zhu, whose work was actually funded early on by an energy initiative seed funding when I was working on it, actually, and has matured into an NSF grant. So the solar cell that's used aboard the Solar Impulse 2 is silicon. This slide will probably give you deja vu. This is a well-worn technology with currently a 25% efficiency. But this structure, this tetrahedral structure, is particularly suited for photovoltaics and leads to other photovoltaic technologies, such as 3-5 tandem cells, which are similar, but you have different columns of the periodic table. These have been shown to have a 48% efficiency, however they're expensive and they're relatively difficult to grow. Another similar technology is cadmium telluride, same structure, it has a 23% efficiency, however it contains toxic elements. So this shows the design problem that we have to face in these materials. So we find materials that are non-toxic, but relatively cheap in this class. So David Mincy is one of the pioneers in what's known as CZTS technology. It's the same structure, but it is non-toxic and it is relatively cheap. It has an efficiency of 12%, but right now it's impeded by growth properties. To get around this, he and his postdoc, Byram Saparov, have come up with a variant known as CBTS, where you replace the zinc with barium and a slight structural transformation. What we can provide as theorists is we can take this structure and then we can predict properties of it suitable for photovoltaics. This is known as a fan structure, and I know it looks like spaghetti, but basically what it is is the energies of an electron within a material. We can then feed these back to the experimentalists and they can decide whether this material would be good for photovoltaic applications. And because we're burning clock cycles instead of $1,000 samples, we can actually scout ahead and look at new other materials. For example, copper, barium, tin, selenide. More work is currently being done on this. Another technology that we're looking at is known as hybrid organic inorganic perovskites. It is a combination of an inorganic perovskite framework and an organic molecule. So this is a combination of two fields which helps lead to collaboration. However, we would like to be able to tune it by changing this molecule, but this is a relatively small area, so we have relatively little chemical flexibility. So what David Mitzi, again, has proposed is a 2D perovskite. That is, we kind of break the bond here, and now we have layers, which allows for greater molecular freedom and possible greater tuning. And what we as theorists can do is we can help figure out design primers that might not have been known before. For example, shown here is the same band structure that I showed before, but this is for a 2D perovskite. There is an um, increasingly well-appreciated effect known as spin orbit coupling. It's important for heavy materials and it's relatively non-relativistic. So this is what the band structure looks like without spin orbit coupling. And one thing that shows up all the time in photovoltaics is what's known as the conduction band. It's the energy an electron is roughly expected to have when it uh, absorbs a photon. Right now, it's currently on the organic without spin orbit coupling. Once we apply spin orbit coupling, however, it shifts over to the organic. Why is this important? Well, the hole, which is where the electron originally was, is still residing on the organic here. So, this, so what we get here is what's known as charge separation. And this is considered to be a very important design parameter for um, photovoltaics. So what this shows is how um, first principles calculations can actually help reveal design properties that we might not have known existed before. And with that, I thank you for your time.